Hello and, and welcome everyone. We're, um, we're glad to have everyone join us today. We're excited for this panel. Um, we are getting all of our panelists on board where they're supposed to be. So um, we're just uh, a few minutes slow on that, but hopefully they'll be they'll be all in soon. We had a couple of issues with um, some of the leaks today. So uh, we appreciate PSO for working those out for us. But I think we'll go ahead and get started just to make sure that we have time for everything. So thank you so much for being here today. Um, my name is Kristen Miller. I'm a faculty member here at the American Public University System in the Space Studies Department. And I am the lead faculty advisor for the APUS Analog Research Group, or ARG, as we like to go by. We are um, we're excited today to share some of the research that we've been working on. Uh, many of these projects we've been working on for more than uh, a couple of years to get um, some really good data. And um, we're, we're really excited to share some of that with you. We appreciate you being here to hear a little bit more from our amazing researchers about some of the work they've been doing. I'm gonna just introduce our group really quickly. I'm not gonna take very much time because um, I think the students are the ones that, that we all wanna hear from. Um, but I will just there we go introduce the group really quickly and then and the panel and then I will turn the time over. So um, ARG is the APUS Analog Research Group. Um, we are a virtual and asynchronous program for student research and leadership at the American Public University System. Uh, Noah, who's on the panel today, is our current program manager, doing a fantastic job. Uh, we are part of the um, American Institute of Aeronautics and Astronautics (AIAA) and I'm grateful for their support as well as the support of uh, the Department of Space Studies, STEM, and um, the Graduate Research Office at the American Public University System. Uh, so ARC has several purposes, but the ones today that really matter to us are these two that I've highlighted in yellow. Um, the main goals of our group are to perform meaningful research, which will be relevant for um, space exploration and settlement initiatives, and especially to foster multidisciplinary team-based um, opportunities for research um, within our online university. And uh, the research that you'll hear about today is a product of these two um, goals of the group. Uh, we have a wide variety of research projects that we sponsor. Um, most of our research is student-led uh, and faculty supported. Um, we have a lot of group projects. We do collaborations with outside agencies. Um, our research is in uh, multidisciplinary, and I just listed a few of the, um, the different areas that we have research in. There are many, many, many kinds of research that can be done very well in an analog setting. And we've been um, fortunate enough to be able to perform missions at some really amazing analog facilities, which you'll hear about today, and uh, utilize those facilities to do these kinds of research. Um, this is one of my favorite little graphs. Um, this just shows you to date, this is accurate, uh, or at least up to date as of um, maybe last winter, uh, the the kinds of research that we do and um, the different kinds of pro projects that we have, um, a lot of botany, but just a really wide range, um, everything from EABA operations to psychological types of studies, astronomy, outreach. Um, it's, it's really kind of exciting to get involved with a project, a project that has um, such a wide reach and, and so many different opportunities for students. Um, so that is a little introduction to us, and um, I want to introduce our panel today. Um, we have our first speaker will be Anthony DiBernardo, um, who will be talking about the role of science communication and space exploration. He'll be followed by Lex Lojek, uh, Nicholas Pender, and then Sarah Guthrie, Keith Pierce, and Noah Loy. Um, I will introduce each one individually before their presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing so that Tony can start um, getting his slides up. And while he does that, I have a little um, introduction that I'll read. Tony DiBernardo is a video producer and science communicator. He aims to bridge the gap between science discovery and our general population's ability to understand not only the science, but its effect on their lives. And he has focused his efforts on both short and long-term media in documentaries, podcasts, social media, YouTube, and academic studies. As the crew journalist for the ARG 1M mission at MDRS, his documentary shows off the science of reality of conducting analog missions in an approachable and inspiring yet scientific manner. Tony, we're so excited for your um, presentation today, and I will let you proceed. 
Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Quick sound check and screen check. Can you hear me and see my screen? Okay, awesome. Uh, well, first, I just want to say real quickly, I'm so excited to, to start this off. You know, the ARG-1M mission for our analog astronaut group uh, was really a special one. We have some really exciting research to tell you guys about today. And I'm just going to kick things off. Um, and my, my project kind of touches all of them in a little bit, but I really urge you to stick around for everyone because... Um, man, we had some crazy science going on, and um, uh, I'm, I'm really excited to hear everyone present. So for, for my um, portion, my project in this mission, uh, it was a little different. It wasn't as research-based. Uh, it was more of a, a project or an effort. Now, today, uh, for those of you who, who may not know, um, communication and outreach is, you know, for space activities, it's essential to educate, not only to educate, but to inspire and help the general public understand the importance of what we do in space and the benefit that it has on their daily life. Uh, you know, a lot of people are saying, why should we spend all this money, you know, going to space when we have so many problems here on earth? And that, that really is the crux of science communication uh, today. You know, 81% of American adults got the COVID booster or the COVID vaccine during the pandemic. Um, but it's remarkably similar that 81% of people, of adults, spend over four hours per day on social media. And so when we think about how our science is being communicated to the world, that's kind of what we're up against. And so your science is not going to communicate itself. And so this presentation is really quickly going to show you um, our efforts in communicating what we've done and kind of the results of that. So you know, as you know, um, without this science communication, these people could eventually grow up, these kids that are seeing this could eventually grow up to make decisions for our community. And they're being constantly bombarded with pseudoscience, conspiracy theories, all, all these types of things. So um, we kind of wanted to try and combat that. So we did this by uh, in two ways, you know, while the efforts available to study kind of seem limitless. Um, this project was actually very, very late to the mission. So we decided to stick to two things in regards to this. Um, now we explored types of outreach communication conducted on an analog research mission. So things that we could actually do on the mission for the sake of right exciting um, uh, or instilling excitement in this research and, and showing it to other people. So um, we did this in two ways. The first one was, oops, forgot to get rid of that slide. Uh, the first one was um, to test conducting real outreach on a mission in real time. So, you know, scientists often forget, like I said, that science does not communicate itself. So we spent an entire day on the mission. We talked to over 200 live Zoom participants on 11 Zoom calls, answering questions and presenting our research, covering audiences from, I think, like eight-year-old students in a classroom, all the way to teams at SpaceX. And so the entire team was in 11-hour-long Zoom sessions just answering questions. And I think that this really, you know, it really gave us a perspective, a different perspective on our research, right? Because the entire team was engaged. They not only got to explain their research, uh, but they fielded live questions from people inside and outside of scientific community, uh, giving the research kind of a new perspective on who could understand and who may not be able to seek it out, right? So it was really exciting to, um, you know, people were astonished, I think, you know, we we were talking about the the botany experience experiment, which you'll hear later. And it was like, yeah, that makes sense. They did botany. They like grew, they they did that kind of experiment that feels scientific. And then Lex comes on there and answers questions about his study. And people are like, wait, you can meditate in space? Like that's a real thing that you could do. And so it was really just, it was really cool to see everyone's reaction to that. Um, so that was the first thing that we did. Now, the second thing was to produce a full length documentary, which the entire team is really, really proud of. Um, and so, I mean, we've seen it, right? Documentaries like Goodnight Oppie, uh, the one that's just coming out a million miles away, uh, which is going nuts on Rotten Tomatoes. It's uh, The public is loving it. Um, these countless space movies that the public kind of get behind and become obsessed over, you know, if they can be among the most watched in non-scientific circles, then we thought analogs might be a great opportunity to capture real people doing real science that any college student or professional could participate in. 
Uh, now, the goal here wasn't to inspire everyone to become an analog astronaut and just become an influencer and post pictures of yourself in a spacesuit, obviously, um, which unfortunately is becoming a thing. But uh, but we did it to lower the barrier of entry uh, to scientific topics in general, uh, make science more approachable. I think I think we did that. So we hiked for hours pulling dummy incapacitated ast uh, astronauts. And you, you guys will see all of this in detail here. Uh, we six, we attempted to germinate seeds flown in space and I will let I <laughs> I will let the team update you on that. We got ready with the crew on spacewalks. We witnessed daily mission planning in real time. So all, everything I'm showing you right now is, you know, in 4K in the documentary and in video format and the team is like narrating it, right? We saw the fruits of that planning, uh, which was really, really exciting. We collected data. We we journeyed with these astronauts on their experiments from beginning to end. And um, we documented when things got wrong, right? The observatory kind of almost broke on us and we had to figure it out. Anyone who's seen one of these power readings knows that all zeros is a bad thing, right? Um, and so we interviewed them, right? So every single astronaut was interviewed and their audio, their testimony of this experience was laid over all the footage. And so ultimately, I'm going to press play here and turn down the sound just to see if it'll it'll play for us. The best of your ability to get the most out of every experience. And can you guys see that okay? Is that coming through? You know, we ended up with a 50-minute documentary. It has over, I think, 1,400 views, views right now. Um, it's all narrated by our crew. And, and while this is a huge win, I mean, we're all very, very proud of this. There's still so much more to do. Mo much more research is needed because, you know, our target audience, the people that, you know, are being bombarded with all of this pseudoscience, they're not just sitting around waiting for documentaries to come out. Like I said, they're spending four plus hours a day on social media and, you know, I think that further research should get rid of all the red tape in, in projects like this. They should spend real time on social media, a TikTok, Reels, in YouTube Shorts, all these places where our audiences are and not be afraid of what, you know, that looks like as a um, organization to be on these types of platforms and really say, you know, Na NASA, you know, has over 300 social media accounts. And there's so much potential that we could do for documenting science so that the general public can see. So one of the next steps proposed for this documentary was to actually break this up into a bunch of short form media content and really educate and inspire the next generation of people interested in science, not even to work in science, but just to be, you know, to live your lives, understanding how it's beneficial. And so um, this presentation today was really uh, to kind of explain our efforts. Um, we'll share the link to the documentary in the chat if you guys are interested in viewing it, but to also um, kind of give you a heads up on all the really exciting research that you will see today. So um, thank you so much for your time. And uh, Dr. Miller, I, I will hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Tony. This was really an amazing um, accomplishment and a fantastic documentary. I love it. And um, we really appreciate you talking about it and the importance of of space communications today. Um, I think because we have so many speakers, we're gonna go ahead and, and keep the questions at the end. So um, to the audience, please do put questions in the Q&A or in the chat and we will um, have some time for those at the end. But I'm gonna go ahead um, with our next speaker, which is Lex. So Lex, while you're pulling up your slides, I'm just gonna introduce you real quick. Alexis Joseph Lojek graduated with a master's in space studies from American Military University in June of 2023. He is a member of the APUS Analog Astronaut Research Group and has attended three analog missions at two sites and gathered data from a fourth and a third site. His research focused on a digital measurement of stress in analog astronaut environments and a potential mitigation technique for overall stress. He is active duty in the U.S. Navy and currently stationed at Naval Support Activity Bahrain. Um, let you go ahead. Thank you for being with us, Lex. <clears throat> hey, thanks, Dr. Miller. But I just want to ask, are you guys seeing the slides? Or are you seeing my presenter view? We are seeing the slides, yes. Okay, great. Okay. Hey, uh, good evening, everybody. It is um, 8 p.m. in Bahrain. Uh, I've been here for about six weeks. So uh, my research that I conducted across three analog missions was, as Dr. Miller said, a digitally assessed measurement of stress in analog astronaut environments. Uh, this is uh, the title of my thesis 
um, trends of potential mitigations. So uh, to start off, who am I? Uh, how am I qualified to give you this presentation? So I am a graduate student, graduate. Uh, I graduated with a master's of science in space studies with a concentration in aerospace science in June of 2023. Uh, I've been active duty in the Navy for 18 years, almost 18 years. December 1st is going to be 18 years. I've made four deployments uh, to, as you know, isolator, confining or extreme environments. Uh, and I participated in three analog astronaut missions. Uh, and, and as a researcher and a, and a test subject. So um, my presentation sections are going to be an introduction and bottom line up front overview of the literature that uh, uh, pertaining to my subject, the methodology, methodology that I used, limitations, data and discussion, and of course, uh, follow on research that really is needed uh, in this field. So why uh, this topic? Why study a digital measurement of stress? So when I was asked what research I wanted to bring to MDRS, that was our very first uh, analog mission, uh, my immediate thought was, you know, I want to find a way to quantify if some sort of breathing technique can reduce stress. So I wanted a digital measurement of stress because uh, it's a way to quantify the data. I chose a Garmin. I'm wearing one right now uh, because... It has a measurement called all day stress uh, that is on the screen. You could see to the right of the, of the device. It's the Garmin Vivo Smart 4 that we use. It gives you like very good data, literally for the entire day, every three minutes. Uh, it's a lot of data. It's pretty high quality. Um, uh, their measurements are based off something called, based off heart rate variability from a company called First Beat Technologies that I think provides an algorithm. I've been trying to engage with them, but they haven't uh, gotten back to me. Um, and then why do we schedule it into a workday? My personal experience with uh, focused breathing or meditation, you know, if you don't schedule it into your day, sometimes you skip it, sometimes you're busy. Um, so I figured it would actually get done if we schedule it. Um, so the bottom line up front, Focused breathing does reduce stress immediately and in the moment. Uh, I, I, I can say that even with the small sample size that we've got, um, I cannot say whether it reduces stress in the long term, unfortunately, again, due to the small sample size and short lengths of time. So <clears throat> uh, over the literature, general effects of stress, uh, stress causes cognitive impairment, emotional control problems, uh, higher cortisol levels can uh, lead to problems with health, weight gain, a higher risk for disease, um, and of course, a higher risk for mental health related issues as well. Uh, effects of stress in an isolated, confined, or extreme environment are similar. Uh, and uh, there's a 540 day analog in Russia where only two out of all the participants uh, did not have like a, a, a really huge. Uh, gain in 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 their stress during over the course of that time uh so what kind of countermeasures are, are good for stress so uh socializing exercising uh in the iss they talked about on time supply runs uh during deployments it's the same thing getting your mail on time um uh also regular focused breathing having good communications with people back home and uh crew schedule management and then the benefits of focused breathing have shown uh, they can both instantly reduce stress and have longer term effects, but you usually need a minimum of 10 to 30 days to do that. Uh, how stress is, is um, measured using heart rate variability. Uh, the body's autonomic nervous system uh, varies your heart and the time between heartbeats. And uh, when, uh, when you are stressed out, uh, your the time between heartbeats steadies, and when you're not stressed out, it actually varies quite a bit. So that's how they're able to give us a number. <clears throat> so my methodology, I have three uh, three analogs, three different techniques. The first one was five minutes a day for eight hours a day, forty minutes total. It's actually really annoying. Uh, the second one uh, was three times a day for ten minutes at a time, thirty minutes total during the day, and finally at MDRS one time a day for uh, 15 minutes total. Uh, my analysis was done as an intent to treat uh, model. In medical studies, there's two primary ways, intent to treat and per protocol. Intent to treat is as if everything went perfectly and per protocol is you only use the data 
that is is proper with a treatment. So I use an intent to treat just because of the small sample size it made it a lot easier. Um, so limitations, of course, I've already talked about this. Small sample size, we're not really in a true isolated confined environment. Uh, if if something went wrong, we could, you know, get get it only be safe. Uh, and the amount of time was limited. It was only two weeks. So uh, that really was one of the biggest problems. Not really long duration. Um, so this is an example of visualization. This is my own data from ARG2I. Uh, in the beginning, uh, you've got weekly average stress levels over the course of four weeks. Uh, the first part of the analog is that gray bar. That's when we didn't do uh, focused breathing. Uh, at second week is when we did do focused breathing. And then of course you have time afterwards as well. So um, the ARG2I overall, uh, the daily stress p-values did not indicate a significance, unfortunately, with 95% confidence uh, level. But um, I, they did show, again, that uh, when you're actually doing focused breathing, stress does reduce in the moment. Um, ARG3I, very similar. I had four participants, but unfortunately, two of them, their data was corrupted. So I really didn't get uh, that much data, regardless of the two participants, I was able to, we were able to show that um, but in the moment, focused breathing does actually reduce stress. And as well, uh, during the mission, uh, which over our three I focused breathing was done the entire time, um, stress was actually reduced over the course of the entire, when you were on mission, as opposed to being off mission. But that could also be being away from the stresses of everyday life. I can't really say. It's not long enough, unfortunately. Arg 1M, uh, six participants, but unfortunately two of them were corrupted uh, for some reason. So that was in 2023. Um, and then again, uh, the focused breathing really did show that it reduces it instantaneously. Um, and uh, when no scheduled focused breathing, if you look here at the chart, um, uh, stress was actually lower than when potentially we were doing over, just over the daily stress uh, but again, that's that's just it's it's just small sample size, it's a small amount of time, and if, if we look at the p value as well, the, the data unfortunately wasn't really significant. So, um, I also got data from an F Mars mission that just went out. Uh, I just got that data yesterday, so I haven't actually done an analysis on it yet. Uh, but it was in a true extreme environment, and I'm looking forward to digging into that. Uh, over the overall, the conclusions. Um, if you if we combine all the data, the p value does show significance, and it does supposedly show that when you're focused breathing, stress is higher. But again, it's just a, such a small amount of time, two weeks. It wasn't enough time to really have a significant effect. But we can show that average stress before and after focused breathing did bring stress down with a confidence level of 1.56 to the negative 33rd power, which is pretty darn good. Um, follow on research, of course, we need a longer time frame. It has to be, I'd say six months or longer. We need a true, uh, I need, of course, uh, significantly more participants, 30 plus, uh, hopefully both in a control group and a non-control group. Um, we need a true isolated confined or extreme environment and Antarctic winter over, uh, on the ISS, although that would limit, of course, the number of participants. Uh, military deployments, I think, would be an excellent uh, area to do this. Um, I need a better system of management. The Garmin was great, but getting the data out of there was actually really frustrating. I had to hand jam it, as we say, into an Excel spreadsheet every day, and that took a lot of time. Um, and then I need a more in-depth analysis. Like, is there a follow-on effect from the focused breathing? Does that last an hour or two hours? Does it last any time at all? Uh, and, and that, that would be really good. I ask questions, but those will be at the end. And I have a whole boatload of references if you want to see them. Thank you. I just hit 10 minutes. Perfect. Thank you so much. Lex. Stress is such, um, a prevalent concern in space exploration. And I think, um, the more that we can understand it in analog environments, the better. Thank you so much for an interesting presentation. We appreciate it. 
Um, Nicholas is next, um, and Nicholas Pender is a graduate student pursuing a master's in space studies from American Military University. He's a member of the APUS Analog um, Research Group and has participated in one APUS mission at the Mars Desert Research Station in Utah. His research is focused on the application of supply cache technologies to extend human exploration on the moon and Mars. He's a logistics planner in the U.S. Air Force, stationed at Ramstein Air Base in Germany, and recently completed a 10-month Air Force Institute of Technology Fellowship with SpaceX in Brownsville, Texas. Thanks for being here, Nick. You're coming in from a long way away. We're glad you're here. <laughs> thank you so much, uh, uh, Dr. Mills, for the introduction. Uh, and thank you all uh, for coming out, for coming here, I'll logging on today uh, to, to pay, uh, pay some attention to our research, uh, the important work happening on our team, uh, this is, I mean, it's, it's been, it's been uh, a real blessing. Um, so getting started, yes. Uh, so my, my focus, my research is on the use of supply cache technologies uh, to extend human exploration on Mars. Uh, it also applies to the moon, uh, but yeah, let's get into it. So the goal of this, uh, this experiment uh, is to demonstrate uh, the uses of, again, uh, supply cache to extend human exploration um so uh to to get started on this research i needed some short-term objectives so um it, it, when i when i first uh started on this research uh i found that uh, there, there wasn't much uh focus done on the actual use of supply caches um there have been uh instances where some some were were used ad hoc but not um but it, but it wasn't like a of the research um, and then some, and then some uh, application or some uh, uses were simulated. They didn't actually have a supply cache on hand. Uh, and so this seemed like an excellent opportunity to potentially explore some some un, some un, an untouched topic. Um, it, it's 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 near and dear to me being a, being a logistician in the Air Force. I was really trying to marry uh, some logistics concepts with with uh, space exploration. Uh, research and so uh, this this is this is where I ended up uh, uh, applying uh, supply cache technologies. Uh, I guess so. Yeah, in the short term, I uh, just wanted to demonstrate actual use cases of supply caches in an analog environment uh, for EVA research. Um, long term, I'm hoping to to gain a better understanding of of the constraints uh, uh, that that involve EVAs, and uh, hopefully we can expand on on the body of EVA research with supply caches. Um, and scale up uh, use of these these caches in different situations. So again, uh, this is just a visualization of, of the research goals um, for the focus uh, at MDRS. Uh, we uh, had, had one cache, uh, just you know, with the cost of resources to to develop it. Um, really, it really just needed to start with one with with with, with the with one model and see how it see how it performs out, out in the field. Um, that, that way, um, we we know what works and does not work, and then can scale up later on. Uh, inside the cache, we are storing. I uh, had little oxygen canisters. Uh, we have water in the form of hydration bladders, uh, form of uh, gel packs, energy gel packs, uh, first aid materials, batteries, and uh, re repair materials and duct tape. Um, so uh, the cache itself. Uh, this, this is what it looked like. A uh, little description. So it, it comprised of, of a, it had a power bank. It has a power bank, a, a 2000 watt battery um, a center there. Uh, section two, you can see that that is our food storage and miscellaneous items area. Uh, section three, that is for, for the hydration storage uh, uh, placed strategically underneath the item number seven, which is the uh, heating element, which heats the cash. Um, uh, so uh, item number four, uh, it, so it uses a thermostat to help regulate the tem temperature. Um, and then we're also tracking, uh, tracking, uh, uh, data, um, temperature data over time. Uh, and it helped, it really helped to visualize uh, the effectiveness of this cache. Um, it was, it's, it's, it's charged by, uh, two, uh, 100 watt solar panels. And so you can see all the equipment for that as well. So the method of my research, I really broke it down into, into five phases. Uh, so first we needed to, to test, uh, Rules, uh, or you know the elements that that would be used during uh, the experiment. So the hydration bladder, we needed to test the suitability of that with the uh, spacesuit, as well as the consuming uh, gel food packs. Um, we need to also establish a baseline uh, for how fast we can travel with it uh, in a mile. Um, 
So, and to do that, it would take a, a hike. So I, I'm going to go through each of these uh, as, as they actually happened. Um, so, and then, uh, so for phase two was to actually uh, position the cache out in the field uh, at one hike, one, one hiking hour from the, from the base. Um, I mean, from, from the science objective, uh, my apologies. Uh, phase two was to uh, make sure that the, that it, it's actually functioning properly. Can we trust and rely on this? Um, because on phase four, um, that was the, that, 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 that is a grand finale um, where we're, we're putting it through the rigors of supporting uh, astronauts in distress. Um, phase five is, was to uh, demonstrate and test the capability for uh, sustainability of the caches and ability to redeploy them uh, when necessary. So yeah, uh, starting with phase one, uh, we needed to establish a baseline, right, uh, for, so for how fast we can move in a spacesuit. Um, and yeah, we did take the opportunity during this phase to test hydration bladders and gel pack functionality. Um, and uh, we, we did over uh, pretty uh, pretty uh, rough terrain, uh, getting to hiking to the ridge of a hissing camel ridge is what, is what it was called out there. Um, both, both, so this uh, testing was broken out into two EBAs. Uh, so this is to get everyone some experience out in the field, but it also really helped uh, 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 create some solid data for us. Uh, we learned that uh, we could average uh, right around 30 minutes uh, to, uh, to a hike in a spacesuit uh, one mile distance. And with that, we were able to project how far we needed to go for that three hour hike. So phase two, uh, it, this took a while to implement. Um, went through some struggles with uh, with uh, 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 to deciding where I could place this cache down at. Um, I really wanted to push it to that three mile distance and, and simulate the breakdown of a rover um, at that location um, to demonstrate this use case. Uh, ended up compromising, um, uh, st uh, st establishing the uh, supply cache um, one hiking hour from the uh, from the base, um, and so that, and 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 I'll explain how how it worked uh, when when we when it came to uh, the uh, emergency scenario, right? So uh, this is, and you can see on the left there, that's where we actually deployed it out in the field, um, taking initial uh, measurements, uh, uh, yeah, initial status of the cache. You can see on the right there the map. Um, phase three, cache assessment. So again, we need to be able to trust this thing if we're going to uh, go on a very long, uh, strenuous uh, hike uh, and and rely on the on the supplies to get us through all of that. So uh, we needed to first see, make sure this thing's been sitting out in the field for a day and come out the following day and to start taking measurements to see how it's performing. Uh, we found that it was uh, regulating temperature pretty well inside. I kept things at, at, a, at a very comfortable 61 degrees Fahrenheit, um, while the external temperatures around that same time were 50. Um, battery level was still full at that point. Uh, so this gave, gave us some real confidence that this thing could, could definitely support. Uh, we did notice uh, uh, that the, uh, the, uh, the solar panels had gotten blown loose uh, the the day uh, because the evening prior a storm had had come through, so that's that's a real world consideration and something I'll I'll, I'll have to uh, take forward uh, in future design uh, designs of this cache. Uh, phase four, the emergency scenario. Uh, so I was as I was saying before, uh, we couldn't actually go um, place the cache three hours hiking distance or um, uh, two hours hiking distance from the base. Um, so we, we, uh, we worked it out to where, uh, we placed the cache that one hiking hour distance, but, um, we, we, what we'll, essentially the way the, uh, the, uh, test worked out is the, the base or well, home base was where the, uh, simulated, uh, uh, objective was where the, uh, the rover had broken down, right? So we started off on foot from the base camp. Uh, towards the cache, so you got to think we're 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 simulating being already out in the field three hours away, um, and we uh, we have each each hiker has two uh, hiking hours worth of uh, of material I mean of materials of supplies on them to help them sustain as a bare minimum, and so the um, the requirement for that um, uh, based on uh, 
uh, this acknowledge is one liter of uh, water for every two hiking hours. So that is what that is what e what each person was outfitted with. Um, you can see over there so some results on consumption. Um, so the first participant consumed uh, a little over 1,100 milliliters of water. The second participant uh, uh, over 1,600. So there's some differences in water. In uh, that honestly, so um, like the differences in the water consumption. Um, also, so gel packs. Uh, it was structured to be consumed every every 30 minutes. Uh, consume a gel pack for energy. Um, this is based on guidance by the manufacturer of that product. Uh, the, 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 the way it's supposed to be used is every 30 minutes. So this helped drive an additional uh, use case for supply caches uh, as we had another item that, that needed to be consumed and replenished. Um, one challenge uh, we ran into with this uh, experiment was we did not get to use the rough terrain where a baseline was was initially established for the uh, for the uh, um, the uh, 30 minute hiking distance, right? So uh, because we had to do this experiment on a road, we were making much greater speed and um, um, a much better time uh, than as we were traveling on uh, uh, off-road terrain. So that, that was a challenge with this experiment. Um, so I'm hoping in the future, uh, you'll see, um, we can uh, hopefully do do this experiment a little more realistically, not being on a road, but on rough terrain. Uh, so phase five, demonstrating resupply and retrieval. Uh, this is important because any, we, the supply cache needs to be sustainable. And so going through the motions of, of resupplying a cache, uh, get, getting supplies out there uh, to, to maintain that, uh, that safety corridor um, th th this is uh, just go going through exercising these uh, these uh, requirements. Uh, just because this has not been explored uh, in in, a, in an analog environment before, so it's good to go through the motions of, of these uh, of these exercises here, um, and then obviously uh, showing the uh, flexibility of the supply cache system to be able to be redeployed in different locations when necessary, establish new support routes. Um, this was the uh, the performance after after uh, retrieval of the cache. Looked at the temperature readings, and you can really see how uh, the the cache was able to regulate temperatures inside. Um, so uh, the blue the blue line uh, that that is the outside temperature. Uh, the red line is the inside temperature of the cache. It, it kept everything nice and protected. Not, uh, nothing froze over inside during the cold nights, um, and the the water was ready to go. That was the main the main concern is the water freezing because uh, we needed that to be consumable. Uh, we're ready to consume uh, during the experiment. Nick, uh, so, yeah, yeah. I'm yeah. so sorry, we're, we're out of time. I'm so sorry, do you okay. want 30 seconds to summarize your, your oh, main conclusion? <laughs> uh, yeah, absolutely. Uh, so 30 seconds, uh, the, uh, future research. Uh, we need to test this thing in harsher environments. It's proven that it's very, uh, it's very uh, uh, effective. At, 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 at maintaining temperatures. So I, I, wanna, I wanna test this in harsher environments. Um, I was provided a lot of design change recommendations through this research. Um, and so we need to do more, uh, more testing on variable terrain. Uh, so uh, thank you all for your time. Um, you, uh, this was an amazing crew. I'm very grateful for their support in this endeavor and grateful to the school. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm so sorry to cut you off. It was a fantastic presentation. We appreciate it. Thank you. Um, our next presenter is Sarah Guthrie. Um, Sarah, I'll let you go ahead and pull up your slides while I do a quick introduction. Sarah is a space studies graduate student attending American Military University and a member of the American um, Public University System um, Analog Research Group. As a member of our program staff, she supports student led research and coordinates public outreach events. Um, additionally, she is an experienced analog researcher who has attended crewed missions as a mission specialist and crew commander at um, University of North Dakota's Inflatable Lunar Mars Analog Habitat and the Mars Society's Mars Desert Research Station. In her attendance, she has carried out several independent and co-investigated research studies, which include contingency operations for EVAs with assistive rescue devices, sustainment efficiency for long-term spaceflight, and EVA mobility enhancement with modular devices. I'll let you go ahead, Sarah. Thank you.
Hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Dr. Miller. Um, I do apologize. My screen is off. I just recently had hip reconstruction last week. So I'm, I'm confined to my bed um, at the moment. Um, I will go ahead and put a disclaimer. If I say anything crazy, those viewpoints do not reflect AARG or AMU, and they are my own and likely the cause of my doctor. Um, so yes, let's get started. So as Dr. Miller mentioned, I am a graduate student um, with AMU. Um, sorry, forgive me. I'm trying to figure out how to do this. Go away. Um, here we go. Does that work? Okay. All right, sorry. Um, I am a graduate student with American Military University. I've been a student since 2010. Um, so I'm also an alumni. I received my bachelor's in science um, in aerospace and in military leadership studies with AMU. Um, I'm currently transitioning from active duty after 20 years of service with the US Air Force. And so uh, right now I'm also working as an orbital analyst uh, for cislunar activities for the Department of Defense. Um, I have been a member with APUS uh, Analog Research Group since 2021, and I've had the great privilege to support fellow student researchers, um, as well as leading my own projects. Um, also, as a member of program staff, I've served as a deputy mission director, a program recruitment coordinator, and right now I'm just supporting ARG's first paired in-situ research analog and technology evaluation, which we call PIRATE, um, mission at the Aquariat Reef Base, um, which you've probably already heard about from Dr. Miller and from the mission lead, uh, Scott Van Hoy. So today I'm just going to focus on my independent projects, and I just want to highlight some of the other studies I've been able to support as either a co-investigator, as a research assistant, or have otherwise facilitated. Um, so again, analog supported research. So from 2021 to 2023, um, I've had the research projects at the Inflatable Lunar Mars Habitat and also at the Mars Desert Research Station. And those have just been kind of focused really heavily on EVAs regarding, you know, uh, rescues and mobility. And then I was also a part of an independent study for uh, what we call resource sustainment, which is basically um, having food supplies um, for long-term missions, um, supporting uh, Alexis's stress mitigation techniques. And then we've also done some youth and public outreach engagements as well, supporting some youth scientific projects. So my number one project here uh, was basically how do we rescue people on the moon, right? So I had this great opportunity as a student, as an online student, um, to be a part of a research group, which is almost unheard of, right? Because people in online schools don't do research, right? Like that's not a thing that we do. And so about two years ago, um, some students and some faculty came together and said, maybe this is a thing that we can do. So I was approached about it when I had just started my space studies academic career and, um, and with an opportunity to attend possibly an analog, but part of that was I had to come up with a research question. And so one of the, the question is, is what can I do as, a, as an online student, as a military member, how can I um, support the scientific community and, you know, exercising my talents and experiences as a military member. And so I started to research the question is, well, we're going to the moon, do, you know, what do we do about if somebody becomes incapacitated on the surface? And so I did some digging through, you know, the 1960s and 1970s, and it turns out that that question really has not been answered. There's been some equipment additions made, you know, like the lunar roving vehicle and the rickshaw that potentially could have been like a cart used on the surface, but the rickshaw failed horribly just in its geological pursuits. Um, and then the LRV, you know, uh, is a is a good backup, but what if the LRV fails, right? So, um, and that's the consideration for future space suit design. So we did some, you know, some literature reviews and digging down into to past things that were attempted and looking at you know NASA's way forward um, as you can see they're kind of highlighted in the bottom about what they what they're considering and what are the needs and one of the needs are is proper suit interface and so we looked at okay how do we incorporate some type of rescue device or rescue protocol that can be integrated into the spacesuit so that's where we kind of started with our first question so Again, being an online research student, we don't have access to a lab or anything, but we have this amazing collaboration research agreement with the University of North Dakota, which was 100% facilitated by Dr. Miller and Scott Van Hoy and their ability to connect with uh, the space flight lab there. And so um, at ILMA it was the first uh, iteration of kind of developing this project. Um, so I just have kind of a couple pictures there highlighted of our fellow astronauts, you know, 
Um, and so we created our very first research question, right? And so the research question was, is, you know, how to understand test, you know, the capability and the mobility to perform contingency extravehicular activities, EVAs, for incapacitated astronauts, basically on the lunar surface, um, and determine what is the best practice for getting them off the field. Because again, this was something that hadn't been performed in depth. It was tried a couple of times at MDRS. Um, and, you know, about 10 years prior to us coming to this mission. And it just wasn't a lot of literature um, done on it and a lot of resolve. And so we created our, what's our first short-term goal is just to kind of find out what kind of techniques and methodologies we could use along these analog tours to understand those pitfalls. And then eventually in the long-term develop, you know, some safety protocols and maybe eventually the development of some equipment. So um, the first mission, woo! Ooh, that is loud. I am so sorry about that. How do I turn that off? Stop it. Stop. I can't. I can't stop it, Dr. Miller. I can't. We aren't actually hearing it, sir. I think you don't hear it. Hearing oh, it. I'm just hearing it. Okay, the videos are really loud in my ear. I <laughs> So as you can see here in ARG2I um, was the first time that we had had tried uh, different methods and different equipment pieces. And we had a, uh, a transport chair that was collapsible. It was lightweight. The astronauts could carry them in their hands um, and then deploy it out and then place an individual on it. And then we had uh, this deployable medical sled and then also a collapsing uh, dolly. Um, as you can see, you know, it's the chair didn't perform super well, the, the dolly didn't perform at all. And we just kind of threw that one out the window um, altogether. That was meant to kind of uh, mimic some past Nemo um, analog missions. But the sled performed really surprisingly well. And one of the great things about the sled is it's used by medical services. It's also used by the U.S. military to extract injured soldiers off of the battlefield. And that's kind of where I had the initial idea or concept to use the medical sled. Um, so what it does is it unfurls it and you deploy it out into the field and you strap an individual in it and it protects them from the environment while keeping them stable. And it's lightweight, transportable and, and relatively inexpensive. Um, so that was kind of our first iteration. You know, this is a, a qualitative test. You know, it's not really quantitative. So we're not taking a lot of hard data points. What we're looking for is the experience. And what UND provides us is this great opportunity to use these really wonderful spacesuits that kind of give us the best fidelity on what it's like to be in a, in a pressurized spacesuit on the surface. Um, so we look at things like being able to walk around, bend over, using our gloves, our range of motion, our limitations, and being able to see what we're doing, and those types of impacts. And then we have Kurt. So UND said there's no way that you can place an astronaut in a suit and throw them around and, and tug them around in a sled. You have to use a dummy. So that's where Kurt kind of was born. Kurt is our kinetic utilization research tool. And uh, he is the, the astronaut that we take with us everywhere we go. And probably now our new mascot um, that gets to explore all these, these strange new worlds with us while we uh, toss him around and, and beat him up pretty well. Um, but he is a grappling dummy. And so for this first test, we were just testing proof of concept with some off the shelf products. And uh, so he only weighs about 20 pounds with, or I'm sorry, about 30 pounds with kitty litter and fluff, you know, just to give him some life. And as you can see, he's, he's very unstable <laughs> in our first iterations here. So we closed up that mission. We learned a lot of good things, you know, from it. And then we came home and then, you know, and that was spring of 22. And so when the fall came around, I was, uh, again, with great privilege of being the mission director for ARG-3I. And, uh, you know, well, maybe I just send this on. What do I do with this project? I'm not quite sure. Alexis, who is the commander of the mission, offered to take Kurt um, along with the crew members. They were very excited to do that. And then an opportunity came available just through some unexpected events that I was able to join the crew. So we, we kind of, you know, took lessons learned from ARG-2I and um, kind of ramped it up a little bit. Threw, we threw the chair away. We threw the dolly away. And we said, okay, our biggest problem with Kurt is we can't hold him. You know, the suit has all these limitations. And this is like a real world challenge. You know, how do astronauts carry each other? And so we kind of then developed through some, some brainstorming between the crew and ARG and then my co-investigator, Keith Pierce, um, to come up with this harness. And so the harness here that you see is just a construction safety harness, but it, the important thing is it attaches in the front because we wanted to make sure we were making considerations for the 
for the plus. So the personal life support pack on the back. Even though Kurt doesn't have one, we want to simulate that it exists. And then we also weighed Kurt down just a little bit more. So in this scenario, he's about 60 pounds. We wanted to get as close as we could to, you know, the training environment being on the moon, but not being so heavy that the astronauts couldn't mobilize him. So we just weighed him down a little bit more with a little bit more kitty fluff. And, um, and then uh, we tried to make sure we were standing appropriately, bending over appropriately, trying to simulate having a pressurized suit. Some of the crew was very vocal about that, that they didn't like, you know, trying to straddle the sled. But um, we were trying to give it our best effort in the environment that we were in, you know, as a limitation of an analog environment um, that we can't simulate everything. So let's try and do our best to simulate as much as we can. And so we learned a lot of great things, as you can see in these pictures. You know, we used large clips to use for the gloves to stick inside and, and how, you know, what was our dexterity with the gloves and bending over and moving him around. And so in this mission, you know, things that we learned is the sled is great. We like the sled, um, but Kurt is still really difficult to handle. And because of his lack of rigidity, you know, because he is just a grappling dummy, he's very narrow throughout the body, the, um, we could only cinch down the harness so much. And so, you know, at the, the end of that mission, we're like, well, maybe then this is, you know, we continue this on with NDRS. And so, yeah, I'm so sorry, we are at time. Um, no way. You, I oh, know. This is, okay. And this is so interesting. I, I just wish okay. I could give you the whole time. So sorry. Um, okay. Maybe, maybe one minute to conclude really quickly. <laughs> okay. All right. So MDRS, we tried one more time. Um, as you can see here, we just started to become a lot more specific with our goals. And so we were, we knew the harness was good. We knew the sled was good. So we wanted to engineer a, a harness that was made specifically for a spacesuit with multiple connection points. And then we try to analyze what are those best connection points for picking someone up. So as you can see, the terrain at MDRS was so ideal. It gives us the highest fidelity of being on another planetary surface. And so the sled did get beat up pretty well, but it protected Kurt. And as you can see, this engineered vest that we had um, gave us an opportunity to try things we had never done before, like two man carry, single man carry. And I can't play the video because all of Tony's pictures and videos are 4K and they won't play. Um, but there's this awesome video of Nicholas uh, going up and down the hill in the fastest record time ever, um, carrying <laughs> Kurt all by himself, who weighs approximately 88 pounds now at this point because we wanted to weigh him down a little bit more. But you know, the terrain taught us a lot, you know, because we were going through ravines and mudflats and rocky areas. And so it gave us a great new perspective on those research methods. Okay. All right. The so next steps, um, I don't know, right? Uh, so what is the future for ARG? It's really important having, you know, investment in ARG allows students to continue their research over more analogs at more facilities. So, so you know, supporting, you know, ARG and, and viewers like you can help us continue that mission on. Um, and, and help, you know, take this to other places. Um, I, for me personally, it's developing a, a better vest, um, I think, you know, that has deployable handles that can be stowed quickly within the hard upper torso of a spacesuit, and then maybe collabing with uh, other institutions. And I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Okay, these were just the other projects that we did. Um, we had the Orange Study and the Dandelion Study, which was submitted by elementary school students that we did at MDRS. Thank you to Nick and to Tyler Hines for, for doing that. Um, and then also too, I, I don't want to steal Keith's thunder, but here is the, the harness that we were able to engineer and try. Um, and the harness did great, wonderful things, and he will talk about that. And the last thing I just want to say, I'm so sorry, Dr. Miller, don't be mad. Um, thank you um, to all of our sponsors, um, like AIAA and the school and SEDS, and for donating money and, and opportunities for students and my, like myself, and then the Mars Society and University of North Dakota for giving us the facilities. And then my crewmates up there, look how handsome they are. Um, thank you guys for supporting uh, my dream to, you know, work in the space community and do great things for humanity. So thank you guys. Sorry, I went over time. I blame the drugs. <clears throat> Sarah, that was wonderful. Thank you so much. I'm so sorry that we had to cut it short. Our next speaker is um, Keith Pierce. Keith, Keith is an American Military University alumni, the Bachelor's in Sports and Health Science and a Master's in Space Studies. He's participated in two ARG missions. Uh, two work studies at um, University of North Dakota's Inflatable Lunar Mars Analog Habitat. Um, once as an analog astronaut mission specialist and once as a researcher. And I am going to go ahead and pull up Keith's slides um, and we will let you take it away, Keith. Let me get these into the right. There we go. All right. All right. Can everybody hear me? I just unmuted. All right, cool. Um, 
yeah, so thanks for the introduction, Dr. Miller. Um, and thanks for inviting me to come and do this. Can I just get the uh, the quad slide next? So, see enough of, uh, okay, cool. Yeah, so um, uh, as, as Dr. Miller said, I, I, I've kind of been involved in, in two of these analog missions. Uh, the first one was the uh, the ARG Elma Habitat uh, 2 mission. And then, uh, you know, as, as one of the participants in, and then the uh, third mission um, continued some research uh, from, from the one I participated in. Um, when I found out I was going to be doing this, um, I, I did as much looking into and research into the, the initial mission as I could. And um, one of the things I saw um, was a common theme was kind of the how, how uncomfortable the, the suits were and, and how like they, they kind of wore down the shoulders, it was difficult to move, it was hard to see, um, they, were, they were hot, like there was all these, all these factors and it just seemed to be a problem. Um, and then doing more research, um, you know, in kind of into into current EVAs, even as they stand, there's there's issues, there's there's problems and issues uh, across the board. Um, you know, uh, whether really across all phases, whether it's training in the neutral buoyancy, um, uh, you know, training um, facility or um, in zero gravity, and then finally on the moon, um, these problems continuously arrive arise. Um, with the EVA suits and the EVAs. And um, it seems to be a, a pretty common one. One is mobility and fit, okay? So, or, or uh, uh, lack of mobility due to the fit, right? And um, basically uh, th there's a very finite number of suits um, in the initial, in the initial uh, missions to like, you know, the Apollo missions and stuff, they pretty much tailor made um, a number of suits per astronaut. Well, nowadays suits are so expensive and they've pretty much just been using the same, you know, the same collection of 30 suits for the last 30 years. And, and as they, as they phase, as they break or they stop being functional anymore, we have less and less and less suits, less and less sizes. And, and none of them is kind of one size fits none at this point with, with all the EVA suits. That's kind of what happens with the mobility. Um, there's also issues with like the load bearing, um, um, even in like the neutral buoyancy, when when they're when the when the astronauts are held at different axes, um, their weight will actually be on their shoulders um, in the neutral buoyancy. The same goes for um, and then even in zero gravity, they're kind of floating in the suit, and when they move around, they don't move the suit. And then finally, when they're on a sur on on the surface, like like on Apollo missions, um, the weight eventually starts to wear. I mean, e even at a decreased load, you know. Um, of, of the moon, they're still carrying 40 or 50 pounds with which with what any any hiker would tell you, you know, if you're walking around for more than 30, 30 minutes to an hour with with 40 or 50 pounds on, you begin to feel it. Right. So then so you start to have metabolic issues. So these are kind of like all the different, you know, problems surrounding um, a suit. Well, looking at some of the solutions uh, that have been proposed, they're pretty much all wrapped around um, you know, just more padding, more padding, you know, or like, um, you know, in some cases they, they've looked at like vests, um, they, they kind of just still just weigh the, weigh the suit down, like, um, but don't really handle the, the, the load distribution correctly. So um, our, my research question and our research question uh, um, at, at the Elm mission was, you know, kind of, is there a way that we can re redistribute this load you know, that's both gonna, that'll, 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 that'll um, address a few of these issues. One is, you know, can we, can we, can we redistribute the load, uh, you know, to, to make it so there's less weight on the shoulders and we kind of like tailor it, spread it across more of the body. And then two, can we, can we additionally make this, you know, double this as, you know, can we, can we make a vest that fits a specific person, you know, within a, within a fixed size suit. So we don't have to carry like, a ton of different types of suits, size suits, but we could size the harness within the suit to the person, you know, so it kind of addresses at least to some extent the, the mobility issues as well as, as the load distribution. So um, uh, the way, way we uh, kind of address this is we broke it into, into four scenarios. So the first one is, is just a baseline evaluation, just run the suit. Um, well, I, I, let me back up just a second. We, we built a course, um, that, that was as standardized as we could. So kind of a standardized distance. We, we kept the terrain as level as possible, as smooth as possible, um, kind of in the area around the habitat. And we kind of built a course, right? And then we, um, and then we built a couple of different, and then we 
came up with a few different factors, you know, like, like heart rate and, and CO2 within the suit. Uh, I think we, 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 we think we measured the, t the temperature. Um, we kind of fixed the speed that they're walking and we came up with some surveys. Okay. Um, and then what we did is we, we, we ran all those variables through the course and then we, we ran the suit in four different configurations. That's, we got the scenario one, which was a uh, baseline evaluation with no, with um, just the suit as designed by UND. Um, and then the second scenario was we introduced uh, um, the uh, harness um, inside the suit. So an internal load distribution system. And then we, uh, and then we, we, we ran the scenario three, which was uh, we use trekking poles with no harness. Trekking poles just to kind of aid in balance. It was just a, another um, parameter uh, way that we could kind of address some of the, some of the weight, some of the load distribution. And then finally we completed uh, the test with um, both the harness and the poles. So that's kind of the overall, um, the, the, the problem, kind of our, our hypothesis, and then kind of the, the, um, the layout of the experiment. Can I get the next slide? Okay, so as as uh, you know, a lot of these ideas um, do. That's that's our the sketch we drew on a on a, on a, a napkin at at uh, Olive Garden while while we were pondering some of the ideas here. And uh, the idea was just to basically put a harness inside us inside the spacesuit uh, that we that we or EDA suit that we already had. And then the idea is that um, so there's there's actually a uh, we have, so the, the for Ilma. Um, two, we picked up a, a harness at Cabela's and then we really just like strapped the harness to, to use the frame that was already on the harness, strapped it to the suit and, and just kind of fit it right inside this, inside the EVA suit for, for the, for the next iteration at, uh, um, for the third, for the third element mission, we, we actually did after several trips to, to Home Depot, we, we built a, we built an EVA suit using piping and attached it to a, to a slightly smaller harness um, just to try to fit it inside the suit better. Um, and on the right, you see the trekking poles. So let's go ahead and slide. Okay, um, this, is the, this is the course that we designed. Um, uh, primarily used, I used Route A in, in Ilma 2. Um, Ilma, I'm not sure if Ilma 3 used a combination of A and B. Um, Maybe somebody, somebody here can help me, but we had two routes set up. We, again, we, we picked the smoothest route possible. We gauged distances um, using, the G, using the GPS, uh, handheld GPSs. Um, looks like they use both, both courses uh, for, for uh, ILMA 3. Um, let's go ahead, uh, slide. Okay, um, so in the first Ilma, it was just me. I was kind of um, do, doing the EVA testing. So it was uh, just me inside an EVA suit and I ran those four, the four different scenarios. Uh, that was really just kind of work out the kinks, figure out like, you know, what we could, what we could learn kind of based on, um, on, the, on, the, on the equipment that we had um, on site. And then, and then on, on Ilma uh, three, we, we did it um, with, the, with the remainder of the crew. So this is just kind of a breakdown of all the participants. We, we used five different participants over the course of uh, 18 different EVAs. Um, and on these 18 EVAs, we, we measured the, uh, the heart rate, the metabolic demands, uh, and then we used uh, CO2 levels. And then we, uh, temperature, we also uh, measured um, through survey, perceived exertion and perceived comfort levels, which I'll show you in later slides. Let's go ahead, uh, slide. All right, so this just uh, this is um, an aggregate of basically all the different um, data that we that that we had. So this is all the different all, all five participants. This was um, all all the different parameters, all kind of just smashed together in a you know in in one big data set. Um, you could break this down by participant and kind of like you know pull out a bunch of different information. But um, as you can see, the, the, the green line is the, is the trekking poles and harness. Now, um, it, 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 showed the, it showed the greatest um, change um, or, or, or impact. But as you can see, the, uh, the trekking poles by themselves made, made, a pretty big, made a pretty big impact. And then uh, everything just kind of goes down as you get closer to baseline. Um, uh, now, some, some numbers on this, the, the mean heart rate was 4.3% lower while using the internal harness uh, versus, the, 
versus just the baseline heart rate of using no harness, which again, if, if you're, if you're a hiker, you've done any type of physical activity, the 4.3% 4 uh, decrease is, is, doesn't sound like a lot, but it's a pretty significant margin when you, when you expand it out over, over hours of activity, you know, you talk about metabolic rate, especially, especially on, um, you know, when you're looking at like the constraints of a, of a, of a space mission and you're looking at like the, the amount of food and calories you're, 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 you're going to require to increase the heart rate. Um, all right. And then, um, additional, additionally, the, uh, the surveys really showed that the largest percentage improvements, it was an 80% improvement when compared, comparing the internal harness, uh, perceived exertion to the, uh, to the trekking, um, and trekking poles to the baseline. So, so using the trekking poles and the harness was a significant increase just in the perceived exertion. So, so how the actual astronaut or how the analog astronauts felt um, using it. And then comfort level is similar numbers, about 74.6% improved. Uh, now, obviously that, that's, that's the qualitative um, numbers, um, you know, when we're talking about the perceived exertion and perceived comfort, but um, de definitely not negligible. All right, so um, so let's go ahead and move on in slides. So we talked about some of the qualitative um, parameters. So we used um, the same uh, measurements that, that NASA actually used um, for, for a similar study on the same topic that they did when they were measuring uh, metabolic exertion and kind of the, the impact it would have on mission. So we, we, tried, to, we tried to mimic um, the kind of the pace that they were walking. We also tried to mimic um, the actual surveys that they use. And this is one of the, one of the scales that they use, which is the Cooper Harper scale. And it just kind of, it's a flow sheet that, you, um, that eventually leads you to an actual number um, of your actual um, ability to move your, you know, um, your mobility, um, which we, I, I, which we used as, you know, for some of the parameters. Okay. Uh, slide. Yeah. And, and actually Keith, this is, um, we are at time. I'm so sorry. Oh, okay. Um, do you mind yeah, no 30 second summary. <laughs> yeah. So summary. So this is the perceived exertion. Um, you can kind of see this again, this is an aggregate of all astronauts over all EVAs. Um, you know, uh, one uh, higher number is higher exertion, lower numbers, lower exertion. Slide. The other, the other, uh, the other survey that we used, Corlett and Bishop. Uh, this was for comfort. Um, so again, it's just a, it's just a uh, scale by body part. All right. Slide. This is uh, just the overall um, comfort level uh, by by scenario. Slide. And then this is the uh, comfort level by by extremity, um, and it's it's kind of by, based on like complaints per area. So this is like obviously shoulders, the weight on the shoulders, and all that. All right, slide. Oh, and that's it. Okay, so um, kind of overall, um, uh, I'll, I'll try to take twenty seconds to wrap this up. So um, we, we uh, basically the the overall result is um, there is definitely some efficacy to using a um, to redistributing the load, um, we were able to at least prove that. However, there there, are, there were significant limitations uh, that you know if there were going to be future um, studies here that would have to be addressed. Um, obviously, um, low number of te test participants, uh, variable participant physiology, and then changing environments, weather, lighting, surface, gravity, all those sorts of things. So, um, any future studies, we 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 definitely want to. Um, Increase the fidelity and uh, you know get a, a lot more specific on on the the, the physiological and uh, psychological conditioning of the uh, uh, or the physical conditioning of the of the actual participant. So um, anyway, uh, that's that's it. Sorry, I went over on time. <laughs> Thank you so much, Keith. That was fascinating. We want to um, beg your indulgence and go just a few minutes over so that we can give Noah a little bit of time to present. Noah is our program manager for the American Public University System Analog Research Group. He specializes in human spaceflight research. Um, he is a Space Force veteran and systems engineer at Sierra Space, and Noah currently resides in Denver, Colorado, where he's pursuing a bachelor in space and aerospace science at APUS. So Noah, I'll let you take it away. <laughs> Awesome. Thank you for the intro. Yeah, I'll be quick, guys. Um, so I'm studying water electrolysis and uh, essentially the application for it uh, in deep space. And 
I'll save everyone kind of the technicalities of the research um, for time, but what's important to drive home here is to understand that for us to have a sustainable presence um, off of Earth, human sustainable presence, we're really going to have to rely on the resources at those local destinations. Um, and where water electrolysis comes into play is that um, uh, the yeah, local but, resources... Um... Okay. <laughs> hey, Sarah, you're, you're unmuted. Oh, shit. I'm... You're good. <laughs> um, but essentially, uh, applying water electrolysis at some of these off-world habitat locations enables the habitat and the simulation not the simulation there the habitat and the astronauts to make use of of water ice um like in shackleton craters at the south pole of the moon um wh where nasa's artemis plan is ex planning to exploit natural resources there and you could melt that water ice and now you have h2o and the process of water electrolysis will be running electric current through that uh, H2O to separate those bonds and to isolate them into oxygen and hydrogen free radicals. Um, so then you would have oxygen to breathe uh, for, for inside the habitat. You um, have application for rocket propellant to get back off of uh, into orbit, into a lunar or Martian orbit without having to bring those resources from Earth, those costly resources from Earth, and allows the resources that do have to come um, from Earth to be scalable to the needs that are that are really need to be um brought to those locations that that, um, that can't be found locally. So water electrolysis allows you to uh, isolate these hydrogen and oxygen atomic free ra radicals. Um, so that's kind of some of the research that we conducted at the at the ELMA location. Um, moving on, the objectives here was to find the most efficient system, the most effic efficient electrodes, um, and the most efficient solution, water solution. And so um, the process, we talked about the process, so I'll skip this. And some of the methods th um, that we use is we use graphite, we have uh, electrodes, we use pl platinum ion electrodes, um, we use uh, copper electrodes, um, and we'd run, we'd run amplitude, different amps and different current through, through the water and collect them into different pressure tubes. Um, so the graphite experiment data, we took 2,500 milliliters of distilled water plus 20 milliliters of sodium hydroxide as a solute, mixed that into a solution. Um, essentially, when you enter a water on it, on its own is not um, the best conductor for electricity, actually. So it takes a while um, for this chemical process to occur. But if you add sodium or sodium hydroxide, that increases the efficiency I found to a rate of 325% with uh, graphite. Um, so we were able to collect 50 milliliters of hydrogen free radicals in eight minutes, 30 seconds, and then 50 milliliters of oxygen free radicals in 25 minutes, 20 seconds. I'm still investigating um, post-analysis of what could have happened for why we had so much less um, or why we had the same amount of hydrogen and oxygen and, and these different amount of times. It's, it, it's supposed to be at a two rate. You get two hydrogen um, items, right? H2O and then one oxygen um, a free radical on its own. But um, there, there could have been off gases that weren't accounted for. Things could have um, the the uh, using alligator clamps as your as your amplitude to your anode and your cathode, your conductors, your electricity conductors, whether it be graphite or platinum electrodes. Um, the surface area for um, the alligator clamps onto these metal conductors were a little off. Sometimes the water would get moved around in the reaction. The alligator clamp would fall off a little bit, which would probably account for um, some of these discrepancies. Uh, in the production of of um, of the uh, the the end all item of of oxygen and hydrogen, um, platinum electrodes were expected to be the the most effective, and they were the least. Um, it took uh, to get twenty milliliters of um, hydrogen and ten milliliters of oxygen. It took an hour and six minutes, so um, pretty much scrapped that one. I think those platinum platinum electrodes also didn't have a lot of surface area with the water um, that we were using with the solution. Um, but then we go into copper electrodes, and this solution um, worked really well. So we had a two hundred twenty five milliliter um, distilled water and fifty milliliters of sodium hydroxide um, graphite conductors. We ran with a running 2.7 amps. Um, we were actually able to get 75 milliliters of oxygen in 22 minutes um, and 20 milliliters of hydrogen um, in an hour. So so still some discrepancies there and um, had a lot more results, but I will uh, I will save those until, and I'll talk about it at the conclusion. Um, but correct, correcting some of the anomalies post-analysis is some of these time gaps um, that we had and raised questions about the kind of the efficiency and the consistency of some of the electrolysis process. Um, but that was mainly with platinum electrodes. 
um, and our uh, copper conductors. And if you can tell here with this solution, these copper conductors were not pure, even though they said they were. So uh, test test some of your materials sometimes before you just trust the advertisement. Um, and then, yeah, so oxygen production. Overall, we uh, um, uh, graphite conductors were able to sustain enough oxygen uh, for one human for 15 minutes. Uh, the platinum electrodes were able to produce enough oxygen to sustain a human for two minutes. Um, and the copper conductors were produced of enough oxygen to, to hypothetically sustain an average human size um, for 14 minutes at an at a average uh, breathing rate. Um, the application for this is, uh, is huge, the scope. So um, critical role, role for emergencies, um, water electrolysis in emergency situations uh, and scenarios during space travel. If, if you have a leak, if there's an explosion on the craft and, and there's an emergency, you're not turning around, right? Maybe if you're on the way to the moon, you can come back quickly. If you're on the way to Mars, your next ride back is two years plus away. So um, with, uh, with using resources on deck, like water, having a lot of extra water and, uh, and, and supply plan and risk mitigation, you would send the crew with months and months of extra water, uh, on a, on a journey to Mars or the moon. Maybe you could hack into those, um, with water electrolysis and quickly resupply the cabin. If there are any leaks, um, bring, bring, bring cabin back to normal, uh, to nominal air pressure, um, and, and back to nominal oxygen levels as well. Um, so not just use on habitats off world, but uh, there's also use for um, space travel and especially in emergency situations. Um, resource autonomy, just electrolysis enabling you to uh, have a little more autonomy with the local resources for off world habitats and um, and have that ability to produce those uh, resources locally that you can use for hydrogen um, uh, rocket propellant to breathe. And also, you know, don't forget that when you have hu humans breathing that oxygen, you can create carbon dioxide, um, pump pump that uh, a molecule into a, a green hab for plants to use to produce more oxygen as well. So the cycle can lead to a lot of um, um, additional benefits, um, a lot of economic and logistic benefits too. So um, looking at the reduced reliance on earth-based supplies um, can really change the way you plan for um, your certain missions to to these habitats. Um, precious cargo, precious space, expensive cargo from Earth can be kept again to the resources that that can't be created from from off world um, from off worlds. And then there's in the environmental impact too of of not having to exploit a lot of these resources um, from Earth. A lot of people don't know this, but like things like helium on Earth is not abundant. It's abundant in the galaxy in the universe, but not on not on Earth. It's it's hard to stay trapped in the in the planet. Um, but uh, so being able to bring these uh, resources without taking them from the earth. And then also the better that we get at using, obviously, and applying uh, local resources with uh, engineering practices off worlds, I'm at eight minutes, um, then the better we get ultimately at exploiting resources um, for human consumption off of this uh, beautiful planet. So we don't have to mine too much into to our own home. Um, and then just future applications is a continued continued missions at uh, Ilma, and then if all goes well at Aquarius as well, um, where Aquarius creates that more realistic condition of underwater labs, especially especially with a uh, pressure simulation. So can apply a few more um, different environmental characteristics to the electrolysis process. So with that, I conclude. Thank you very much. No, thank you so much. I'm so sorry that we're over, but thank you so much to each of our panelists who did a fantastic job. We need to um, let the next group come into the room, um, but thank you so much and thank you to the audience for being here and, um, and to each of our presenters. Um, fantastic job on the panel, guys. Um, thank you, and we'll see you in the next section session. I'm sorry we went a little bit over. We apologize for that, <laughs> and I'm sorry we ran out of time for questions as well, but thank you all for being here. <laughs> Take care, guys.